Hello, everybody, and welcome to another community Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to live this Friday at the Just one portion of the business. I think it's a good thing to start with. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for this opportunity. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another community conversation right here on Facebook Live. I'm Mayor Eric Pappenfuss, and today's topic is perseverance and innovation amidst COVID-19. We've got uh, a great selection of guests from uh, the young to the old here uh, on today's show. We're going to get to them in just a minute, but I wanted to begin with a brief discussion of the BioBot data. Moment, you can bring up the latest graph uh, if you would, but I am particularly particularly encouraged that uh, the trend continues to be a downward one regarding uh, the prevalence of the virus here in Harrisburg. If you look at the graph, and we're on a uh, every other week uh, sample timeline at the moment, um, you see that March is, is, is even below that of February, and uh, we're headed in the right direction. And that correlates uh, to the um, larger testing results we're seeing nationally and also uh, elsewhere in Pennsylvania. If we switch over to the other uh, graph, uh, you'll see that we're down to an incident rate, which is the lowest I've seen um, in a while, and that is about 65 new cases a day. Now, the virus is still there. It's still, um, it's still spreading in Harrisburg, but it's down. It's way down from, uh, from where it's been. I think all of that um, is, is a cautionary tale. It reminds us we're not uh, through the woods yet, but that the light is indeed at the end of the tunnel. And that's one of the reasons we want to we want to talk about uh, some of the innovative and uh, persevering uh, things which uh, people are doing because we are going to have quite um, quite a return, uh, quite a bump. I think there's going to be an economic boom uh, as we get past COVID here in the city. We're seeing that in all the development projects. We're seeing that with all of the uh, interest um, from entrepreneurs and others to get back to business and back to um, back to some degree of normalcy in Harrisburg and. Uh, President Biden, as everyone has seen, is uh, promising the vaccine will be available to all those uh, uh, who wish it uh, by, uh, you know, by the end of the spring, early summer. And uh, as a result, I, I think we're positioning ourselves very well. So that's the BioBot data, and uh, it tells a, a good story and a good narrative for our city. I uh, want to also remind folks about a few things we discussed on uh, the last couple shows that we've done. First of all, the playground survey is still very much up and running. Um, we want your in, uh, input on the Shoots and Ladders playground project that we have going on in Reservoir Park. This will be the next major playground renovation for the city of Harrisburg. It'll be completely different uh, and an expansion of what currently exists. Um, and you can go to our website and fill out that survey at harrisburgpa.gov slash Bureau of Parks and Recreation. Uh, we're getting a lot of good feedback, I understand, um, from our Parks and Rec department, but we still want yours. So please, please fill out the feedback. Also, if you're a regular watching of this, uh, watcher of this show, you'll know that we um, met with uh, Frank Gum Grumbine and members of the Historical Architecture Review Board, and we discussed some of the historic district changes that were, uh, were coming forth uh, this year. And uh, those design changes and the new preservation guide are, are, are now out, and they're going to be available for virtual public discussion coming up here on March 18th at 5.30 p.m. and March 25th at 5.30 p.m. And uh, the purpose of the document is to outline the city's historic preservation program. And we're inviting everybody to uh, please, uh, if you're interested, participate in those, uh, those meetings via public comment. And I'm sure Moman will have more to send out on those. There's, a, there's another meeting coming up, and I think we'll have a press release on this uh, later today, Moman. Uh, we just got word from Harrisburg University that they are going to be having a, uh, well, at least Whiting Turner, which is uh, the lead um, uh, contractor on the u new university building for the downtown, is going to be having a uh, virtual discussion and uh, a pre bid opportunity for their fit out documents. Which, uh, which has to do with the work that will be done inside the new building once it's constructed. That's coming up here on Monday the 15th, and we'll have more information on how to zoom into that meeting. And if you know anyone that's interested in doing work inside that building, uh, they may want to take advantage of joining that virtually on Monday the 15th. And then finally, uh, City Council will be hosting a, a work session this Tuesday. That's March 16th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, those sessions, as always, are via Zoom but you can participate um, by uh, signing in and joining us. 
We're going to begin today's show live. It is Facebook Live, after all. And uh, I want to go uh, first to the Heinz Menneker Senior Center, where I believe our new community policing director, Mr. Blake Lynch, is, uh, is outside. There he is. And uh, is with, uh, with the director of the Senior Center, Mr. Les Ford. Um, Les, what's, uh, what's going on at Heinz Menneker today? Well, we have a very important day here in that this is one of many efforts to inoculate the senior citizens and the citizens of Harrisburg and the surrounding area against the COVID vaccine. So we're part of that community-based rollout that has been touted since uh, mid-January. It is now in actuality, and more importantly, it's in actuality here in Harrisburg. Well, that, that's great news, and uh, it's, uh, it's something I know that uh, we've been fighting for for, uh, for many weeks, indeed months. Uh, and uh, it's good to know that it's happening. Uh, how many people are, are, are being vaccinated today? What can you tell me about the, the turnout so far? We're scheduled for 250 shots. Uh, we're probably close to half of that by now. We'll be here into the three o'clock hour, probably closer to four before we break down. We expect to uh, give out every shot that we have. Mm. There is no point in any vaccine going to waste I don't think that will be the case, but if it is, we have standby plans in terms of how to make sure that we inoculate as many people as possible. One of the things that has been absurd to me throughout this whole pandemic is the myth that minorities, specifically black people, are not interested in getting vaccinated. I put the lie to that. I challenge that. That is lie, that is propaganda, that is counterproductive, as Dr. Fauci says, follow the science. So I offer today as a scientific data point as to the degree to which minorities, specifically in Harrisburg, want to get the vaccine. It is incumbent upon the state, county, and local government to provide those opportunities. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, it's it's good to see. And I know it's been a lot of uh, a lot of work on 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 your part and the part of others. A lot of advocacy to make this happen. Uh, this is in conjunction with uh, with another uh, uh, vaccine uh, um, event, which which happened recently at the Jackson Lick High Rise, a senior high rise living uh, area in Harrisburg. Uh, still not enough vaccine to go around for everyone, but we're we're beginning to start to make the inroads. Can you talk a little bit about how this this came to pass? Les, um, how, how were you able to make this happen today? Well, actually, uh, the driving force behind this from our point of view has been Hamilton Health. Uh, they partnered with uh, Capital Blue Cross and Rite Aid and began a process. Uh, they came to us and said, we would like to have a station up in uh, Midtown here where we are. And uh, we naturally volunteered the center right away. The center has been shut down. We have run meals programs out of here daily. We have cooperated with the Harrisburg Police Department, Community Policing Division, uh, putting out emergency boxes. This was a natural follow-on that we would step up to be a site for the COVID vaccination program. So it's a natural to us. It fits. Okay. Well, th thanks a lot, Les. And uh, Blake, one question for you since you're there. Um, how's, uh, how's the turnout been? Has it been uh, relatively straightforward? And what's been the role of uh, our community policing team? Sure, sure, Mr. Mayor. So the uh, turnout has been fantastic. Uh, we have uh, a lot of people that have come out so far, as Mr. Ford has said. Uh, we have our officers that are out right now talking with residents, helping them direct traffic, answering quality of life questions that they may have about different things in the community. It's always uh, advantageous for us to be out in the community and just again, quality of life, answering questions and assisting. Uh, and then as you see currently now, there is a line going into the senior center right now. People are registering, they're getting ready to go in. So we're very excited about that, Mr. Mayor. Okay, well, thank you, Blake. Thank you, Les, for all that you're doing. And if people are watching at home, hopefully this is this is really signaling that the uh, that the backlog and the the roadblocks that we had for the vaccine distribution as recently as just a few weeks ago are beginning to clear. The vaccine is going to be distributed more widely, and most importantly, there is a demand for it and a need for it. We're putting to rest any myths that uh, that folks, especially in minority communities in the city, aren't interested in the vaccine. That's not true, and clearly not true by um, the lines and the uh, outreach we're, we're seeing today. So thank you both for joining us. And we'll go back into the studio. And as I say, we're going from the old to the young. And we're going we're gonna to talk about a very innovative 
um, uh, class here that we have uh, at uh, Lingelstown Middle School in the Central Dauphin School District. And uh, not everybody viewing may know this, but I used to teach at the Lingelstown Middle School. So it was, uh, it was part of my first experience here in the 90s, uh, getting to know Harrisburg in the area. I taught, uh, I taught Latin. I had the experience of dealing with a number of gifted students, um, uh, especially uh, those in 6th uh, uh, and 7th grade. And we've got a great class, great class here. So um, I want to start by introducing the gifted teacher, and that's Allison Sturbinsky. And I know we're going to go to the students in just a minute, but uh, Ms. Sturbinsky, do you want to just uh, set the stage here and tell us uh, a little bit about your class? Absolutely. Um, these are just a few of the students that were working on this project uh, recently. It's the Samsung Solve for Tomorrow competition. Um, and they've been working really, really hard uh, over the last few months, um, both remotely and also in school, kind of a combination of both to pull this all together. Um, and their innovative STEM project that they're gonna talk to you about, um, you know, can really make a difference, I think, for not only, um, you know, the current COVID situation, but also the way that we look at viruses in the future. Yeah, that's wonderful. And uh, okay, well, let's let's get right to it. Now, and uh, it's good to see uh, so many uh, faces zooming in with us, uh, but I understand we've got a couple uh, specific uh, presenters. So we'll go to Irene first. Um, Irene, uh, can, uh, this is Irene uh, Sedum, if I'm saying your name properly. Can you, um, can you tell me a little bit about your project? So our project idea is basically a small sensor that clips onto your mask. Hmm. You'll be able to transfer it from a mask to another, and it will relay the information that it tracks to an app. The goal is to make it easier for people to protect themselves from COVID-19 as well as other viruses. Information gathered will include how long the mask was worn, contact with different people, the safety of that contact, etc. So the app will also allow people to access local news about viruses and to log and track their symptoms, which can then be sent to doctors. Wow, that's incredible. Now, uh, how, how did you come up with, uh, with this, this, this project? Irene, can I, can I follow up with you, and then I'll I'll go to Lucy next. Yeah, go ahead, Irene. So we were looking for a more effective way to track viruses. Throughout the planning process, we landed the, on the idea of a face mask with a computer inside it. And over time, as we worked through the competition process, we met frequently and worked hard to further the concept until it evolved into what it is now. Wow. That is wonderful. Uh, Lucy, let me, uh, let me go to you. Uh, this is Lucy Tibbs, and uh, let me ask you a little bit. So how has, uh, how has COVID-19 basically affected the way you, you, you guys have approached this project as opposed to um, how you would normally do uh, a school project in, uh, when things uh, aren't virtual? Um, well, throughout the process of this competition, um, our school has unfortunately been closing and opening up again due to COVID. So as a team, we decided we would meet at least once a week, whether we had to meet over Zoom or in person at school. Some of our team members were at school and some of them were at home. And we had to learn to overcome the obstacles that occur because of distance learning. But we eventually figured out how to cooperate between Zoom and in-person learning to further our idea. Yeah, and that's uh, that's that's I'm sure been uh, been a, been an interesting interesting experience, a difficult one. But you guys have persevered, managed to come up with a great project here, and work together. So, what are the next steps? What do you do now? You've got this great idea. Uh, tell us uh, what happens next with regard to the project. Our goal throughout the whole project was always going to be to come up with a creative way to make living through this pandemic an easier situation. So while we further our product throughout the competition, we want, we're, well, we want to create something that could help us control future and current viruses. That's wonderful. Well, let me introduce the other folks that are on here. We've got uh, Lizzie Camilli and Alex Mendelson. We've got Luke uh, Hitchcock, Raiden Gordon, uh, Bryn DeFrank, and Annabelle Freetag. 
and uh, uh, it's just great to see everybody. Now, I understand that uh, you all may have some questions for me, so Irene, should we go back to you, and then we can alternate with you and, um, and Lucy again? Do you, have, um, do you have some questions you want to ask? Yes. Okay, so our first question is about the impact that COVID has had on the community. Wow. wow. Well, uh, you were probably watching uh, at the at the beginning of the show. Did you see the Did you see the graph that we put up uh, with um, with the spikes and the impact? It really shows the degree to which uh, the virus has been extremely prevalent uh, in in Harrisburg, in particular, and the surrounding areas. Um, it's uh, it, it's been a whole a whole new world for for the last year. Much like you all had to adapt your your class to a sort of virtual um, uh, online hybrid type of learning, we've had to do the same thing with all of our public meetings in the city, uh, with business as usual. I've done this show now uh, every Friday. Uh, we started in March of last year. It's been over 50 shows, and and this is part of an opportunity to reach people um, in in new ways and different ways than in the regular course of business uh, at the city. Um, we've had different stages of the pandemic, but uh, now, now we're really focused on, on making sure that the vaccine is available to all those who need it. And that's why we started with the, uh, the live shot there from our senior center in the, in the middle of Harrisburg. These are folks that have been uh, desperately wanting the vaccine. We're finally able to get it. Um, the supply chain issues are, are now being addressed by uh, the new administration in DC, and we're, we're pleased by that. Um, do you have another question? So how has the outlook on viruses changed since COVID-19? And will it, do you think it will have an impact on the way that we look at viruses in the future? Oh, uh, oh, I think so. Um, I think that, uh, well, uh, I'll tell you, um, my, my son, who is a little bit older than you all, uh, just did a project for National History Day. And he did uh, his uh, documentary, he did a video documentary on uh, the history of the 1918 influenza, sometimes called the Spanish flu. And what is amazing about that story is that um, we didn't really learn uh, what we should have learned from that uh, same pandemic that happened uh, 100 years ago. Uh, it involved um, a very deadly transmission of a virus that could have been prevented if people had um, uh, had followed uh, the Red Cross's guidelines at that time and worn masks. There were whole organizations called the Anti-Mask League and, and others in San Francisco that, that came forth and, and really denied the realities. And as a result, in 1918, followed by 1919 and 1920, you had uh, you had a recurrence. You had um, uh, a new waves come back again and again each year, and um, and and so um, you'd think we'd we'd learn from 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 the past. Uh, we also have this mixed uh, history of. Uh, I believe the vaccine is very safe. I believe um, it is uh, it is absolutely um, uh, the the right choice for people uh, to make. But you still have concerns and resistance uh, to that based on um, uh, sort of understandings of of history and maybe a, a lack of uh, understandings of the of the actual medical science behind things. So I think there are a lot of lessons that we we will hopefully learn um, as we as we move forward. And there's some positive positive things that have come out of it. I do think the ability to uh, gather virtually. Um, I, I know it's probably been difficult for you guys as learners. I know my kids have, have, have struggled at times with uh, trying to balance everything and being in front of the computer all day long. But um, we've seen on the city side more people participating in public meetings than ever before. So before the, um, the pandemic, maybe we get three or four people that would comment at, at a meeting because you'd have to drive downtown and park and go to a meeting and say, and now when it's on Zoom and it's easier, we've had dozens and dozens of people commenting. So maybe, maybe uh, people are coming together in new ways that'll have uh, lasting uh, uh, legacies that are positive. And uh, okay, and then Lucy, did you have a, a question for me? Uh, yeah, so throughout this pandemic, we've obviously had to take a bunch of many safety precautions like wearing a mask, social distancing, contract tracing and quarantining. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to hear about how that helped lessen the COVID cases. Yeah, it, it, that's exactly right. It's made it's made a big difference. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in, in a way which is uh, one of the things which has puzzled me about um, our, our graph has been um, has been the fact that in Harrisburg, 
the prevalence of the virus has been has been much higher than elsewhere in the country for significant periods of time. And that is despite the fact that we have been uh, enforcing uh, uh, the uh, people. If you walk through the city of Harrisburg, you will see that people wear masks much more frequently than uh, perhaps they do um, in other in other counties or other municipalities. And so people and people also have been following the social distancing guidelines uh, from a city standpoint. We've been we've been changing the way we do events and we we've uh, we just had an interesting outdoor ice in the Berg Festival in which we encourage people to walk on their own to see the ice sculptures. I don't know if any of you guys made it to Harrisburg to see the ice sculptures last weekend, but it was the ability to do an event in a socially distant and safe way. Despite all that, we've, we've still seen the virus be, be, be very prevalent in Harrisburg. And I asked, uh, I asked a doctor uh, from UPMC, you know, what, what, why that was. And it had to do with the fact that we have a lot of, uh, uh, of intergenerational households in Harrisburg. And we have a lot of folks that were spreading the uh, virus uh, within their homes that, um, uh, you know, in which they were perhaps asymptomatic. They didn't even know they had it and they were, they were spreading it. So um, it's a, it's been a challenge to uh, to get those um, uh, to to talk about those important things, which we've done every week, but also to get the virus under control. So it's only been pretty recently that we're beginning to see a real decline, and I'm very hopeful for the future, especially as the vaccine rollout becomes more prevalent, that uh, that we're, we're we're definitely headed in the right direction. So thanks for that. Okay, is there is there any final any final question from from the group? I think we did have one last question. Okay. Okay. Um, I was wondering what the most challenging part of handling this pandemic was within the city and the community. I would say the most challenging part was uh, was communicating uh, at a time when you couldn't use uh, the, the some of the traditional traditional methods. Um, you know, even as a as a as a candidate. It's been very interesting. Uh, we're having an election cycle now in Harrisburg, and uh, it, traditionally you'd go door to door and you'd have long conversations in people's uh, living rooms. And you can do some of that, and you can do it safely, and you can wear a mask and be socially distant. But it's it's hard. And so, um, uh, very early on, we've we've we committed uh, uh, committed to having a, a sort of central clearinghouse on our website for information. We've gotten that information out through um, all sorts of uh, uh, digital social media ways, but also through traditional mailings and uh, trying to reach people um, amidst uh, amidst the pandemic has been has been a challenge. But I think we've uh, we, we, we've done pretty well, as well as to stay uh, optimistic and to realize that we can learn from history, like the lessons we talked about 100 years ago. But we um, we also were going to make it through it. It was just a, a matter of, um, you know, sticking together and innovating and persevering, which is the theme of our show. So. I want to thank you all. You guys are amazing. You remind me of my, my teaching times. That was over 20 years ago. But um, what a great class. Continue, uh, continue innovating and thinking and, and doing all the hard work. And really, you're a great segue into our, our next group, um, which is uh, we're going to be joined by Ted Black, who is the uh, president and CEO of the Whitaker Center for Science and the Arts here in Harrisburg. And uh, Boy, Ted, I hope you were as impressed as I was with um, with all the kids from uh, uh, from the middle school, but um, they seem uh, they seem like the uh, next generation of uh, uh, scientific uh, in innovators, and uh, really uh, probably your target audience there at Whitaker Center. But let's talk a little bit about um, how the Whitaker Center has managed to uh, sort of pivot and uh, and adapt its uh, its programming and uh, its outreach during the pandemic. Yes, uh, thanks, Marin, and absolutely wildly impressed with um, with those kids. So the, the maturity level, even just the maturity level of the questions, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, is, it was was interesting. Um, so good job to to those groups, those kids who, who I'm sure represented their classmates equally well. Um, yes, you're right. Uh, so that that is the future. When we talk about STEM, for example, uh, teacher was talking about their STEM project that age group and, and actually earlier is when kids sh need to get involved in STEM, especially certain groups. You know, there is a generate, there is a uh, gender gap uh, in STEM profession right now. So if you look at uh, professionals in STEM, you know, in their twenties, there's a significant gap. Um, it's, you know, roughly about 70, 30, I think it's closing. 
but the way to close that gap isn't by starting something up, you know, and looking back 10 weeks or, or 10 months, you, you have to reach all the way back into elementary school because uh, if a little girl, for example, by grade five isn't involved in STEM or really interested in STEM, there's this, the data shows that she falls off an educational cliff. So wonderful affirmation that that, uh, that school and, and their wonderful teacher are doing a great job. And that's what Whitaker is all about. Um, that's where you get your first introduction to, uh, and, and maybe when you're crawling uh, in pre-K programs, your first introduction to STEM learning here. And you're also your first introduction to the arts because we also talk a lot about STEAM. Uh, the A in STEAM is for arts. So you just take STEM and, and add the arts to it. And I think all of that is very, very important. And, and Harrisburg's very lucky uh, to have a, a facility like Whitaker Center. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and uh, I agree. So, um, but uh, but how have you basically uh, adapted your programming? I know that we've um, uh, uh, we've profiled some of the things that you've done, but can you can you tell the public? Uh, I see uh, I see, for instance, in this morning's uh, uh, Patriot News on Penn Live that uh, you're going to be uh, reopening. Um, but 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 how have you made it uh, basically since uh, March of last year to now? is day 365 from when we uh, closed our doors uh, to the general public for programming. And today we reopened our doors. Um, Our phase one uh, is limited by reservation just to make sure we have uh, are complying with the the state and federal and CDC requirements. But uh, you alluded to this. I I think everyone, whether you're in politics, whether you're in school, whether you're in business, everyone had to shift to, um, to virtual and, and we did that as well. Um, I guess the one program I would point to, and we did many things virtually that I would point to though, is we do a program called Surgery Live and it's targeted for a little bit older kids in high school and they can come into the digital cinema and they can get a live feed from Hershey Med um, where the doctor's using a scope inside of somebody's stomach, for example, to perform a procedure. Um, we did, we shifted that to virtual. Uh, so in partnership with, uh, with Hershey Med, we we're able to take that program to high schools. And there are many tragedies with the pandemic. There are also things that are going to make us better. Um, and I think one of the things that will help Whitaker uh, be better and others is the ability to take a program like that and not be uh, bound by any geography. You're not bound by how, how far it is the drive to Harrisburg or to Whitaker Center. If we have a program like that that we can offer that is world class, uh, we can offer it everywhere, and we can offer it in different languages too. So that part of it's wildly exciting. Yeah, and would you say that um, that's an example of uh, something which is sort of emerged as an innovative idea amidst the the pandemic, but um, will will last long after? Uh, and that uh, you know we we've learned how to um, uh, share and reach people in 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 new ways that 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 ought to have a, a real positive effect. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they say that Newton, you know, did a lot of his best work during a pandemic. Hmm. Um, sounds like these kids are actually doing a lot of their best work. They, they may be really onto something and, and develop an app. And maybe that's the next Elon Musk uh, right. in that group. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think for us, it's we've talked a lot about Whitaker without walls and uh, having to close our building um, uh, allowed us to to really accelerate that thinking. And I, and I think for a lot of businesses, uh, entities that have, have found a way through this, the pandemic really accelerated some of that business planning for about five years. And I think that's the case for Whitaker as well. That's great. And I know uh, you've also taken the time to really focus on uh, uh, new and enriched partnerships uh, with uh, various community organizations. Do you want to highlight uh, a few more of those? Um, well, that's that's great because I think one of one of your next uh, upcoming guests is is a great example of that as well. Uh, what the pandemic also did is gave uh, everyone the incentive, uh, greater incentive, and the platform to start to collaborate within the arts community. So we've been on calls with with Gamut Theater and and uh, uh, with the, the Harrisburg Symphony, with Market Square Concerts, and with, with some of the other groups. So it's allowed us to think more. Um, uh, empathetic em- empathy mm-hmm. toward others um, and so often we do things um, and and it's somewhat competitive and com- competition is good but 
collaborative comp competition is much, much better. So what this has done for us is, is out, allowed us to start to think about um, other organizations, especially nonprofits. And what if our strength helps them fill one of their weaknesses? What if one of their strengths help us fill one of our weaknesses? Um, and so we've done that. We, we've helped the Harrisburg Symphony, for example. They, they didn't have anywhere to, to perform for their live stream uh, concerts to keep the music playing because the forum, uh, because of COVID and the restrictions and, and some renovation repairs that were going on, they had nowhere to even have that take place. We gladly opened up our doors. Now it wasn't open to the public, but it gave them a beautiful venue to perform. And, and the legacy of the pandemic will be, there will be far more collaboration within the nonprofit groups in Harrisburg. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, that's another one of those, um, you know, just uh, positives that we can take out of uh, take out of the pandemic. And I, I also think the uh, the desire for people to um, seek out uh, community and relationships and uh, and move past some of the isolation that the the uh, pandemic has brought is going to encourage people to um, to want to collaborate even more. And we should see a real boom in um, in the arts and in community programming moving forward. Hey, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, your approach to events. I, I mentioned our Ice in the Berg Festival and how we, we sort of adapted uh, even the holiday parade to be a reverse, uh, uh, reverse parade this year. I know you've got um, some events uh, coming up, and uh, uh, they're, they're pretty innovative. Uh, what can you tell us about those? Well, back in October, we hosted a, 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 a place for people to come in safely and, and do trick or treating. Mm -hmm. Trick or treating is, you know, all of us look fondly of our youth of going door to door. And obviously that wasn't possible this year. So we found a way trail through uh, Whitaker Center to celebrate Halloween and give kids treats. And, and thanks to Hershey's, um, they give, you know, they're so generous in our community. Um, so they, they helped to sponsor that and provide, uh, mm -hmm. provide the candy. We're going to do something similar on March 27th called the Bunny Trail, where you'll be able to come down and walk through and um, uh, celebrate Easter. And that will be um, uh, on March 27th, as I said, uh, there'll be some take-home activities um, and just to celebrate, you know, celebrate spring, celebrate rebirth, celebrate, you know, the next phase that we're entering now, which is very exciting. Yeah, that's great. Looking forward to that. And um, as we mentioned, uh, you are you're reopening as we speak. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? And, and do you have any other exciting new programs that are, are lined up uh, maybe coming later this summer or this fall? Yes, for sure. Um Oh, and on just a personal level, it's just so nice to walk through and see um, families together. Uh, everyone is, you know, maintaining social distance, and, and there's plenty of hand washing and sanitizing, and 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 you know, wiping down of exhibits. But just to see folks, you know, parent, child, caregiver, child together is very inspiring for our staff. Those are things that really don't, you know, show up in. You know, when you're looking at cold business numbers or things like that and projects and at the end of the day that's really what it's all about um, as for us our exciting project and you're going to hear a lot more about it um, in the coming weeks is uh, going back to what we talked about earlier about the pandemic causing um, businesses and entities to accelerate some of their thinking we took a hard look at different things that we do and why we do it um, and we looked at our museum store uh, that we had the wonder store and when we opened 20 years ago that was uh, that was great because there were a lot of things in there that maybe you couldn't find amazon didn't exist 20 years ago uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, amazon does exist and online shopping does exist and anything that we offer in there you can find with a couple clicks somewhere else have it delivered to your door maybe the same day um, and, and it's not going to be the same competitive uh, price we can't offer that so we decided to get out of the museum store business and open up that opportunity for that real estate. If you look at Whitaker as, as real estate, that's beachfront real estate because everyone goes by. It's the old saying, exit through the gift shop. And we're going to convert that whole area uh, and, and have a greater connectivity to our select medical digital cinema. Uh, and create what we're calling the innovation zone. And it'll be a place for the kids, you know, kids just like what you just you just featured on your show. Um, and the first phase of that is going to be what we're calling the purposeful gaming studio. 
And that will take, uh, and purposeful gaming is a purposeful term because we talk, people talk about esports and, and the esports conversation in Harrisburg really started at Whitaker Center. And this is part of our vision is to take esports, make it purposeful. Kids are interested in playing video games and you know parents are seeing that quite a bit. How do you take that interest in something like that and leverage it into an interest in coding, interest in what some of these kids just did, an interest in graphic design. So there's a lot of left brain, right brain, interest in the arts, interest in storytelling, interest in, in, in the competition, which is good too. And then how do we incorporate the other investments that have been made in Whitaker Center? We have a 40 foot high digital cinema right next door to where we're doing this. That's a giant computer screen. You can watch movies on it. We do our surgery live program, but you can all do a lot of interactive um, gamification education uh, in that space. So that's our wildly exciting project. We received a $750,000 RACP grant. Uh, we were one of only five projects in the state uh, that were awarded a RACP grant. And so I think that's also an endorsement from the state level that there is a lot of value to taking something that kids are doing now, the games, and leveraging that opportunity. I, I jokingly say it's tricking kids into the vegetables, but you don't have to trick these kids. These kids, you know, we just showed that they're wildly interested in science and technology and education, um, and it's accelerating at a high rate, and kids' uh, adaptation to technology is stunning. Kids seem to be able to operate an iPad before they are out of a stroller. And so we're very, very excited about that project. And that'll be opened up October 1. Wow, that's uh, that's great. And that's fast turnaround. And congratulations on that, uh, that state grant. Uh, thanks for letting us know about how the Whitaker Center has been innovating uh, through the pandemic and will continue to be a real uh, cornerstone for all that we do here in Harrisburg. Appreciate your time. I, I want to go now to Julie James, co-owner of the Radish and Rye Food Hub, and talk a little bit about uh, one of the businesses in Harrisburg that um, uh, has not only persevered through the pandemic, but uh, it has grown and has just opened a remarkable uh, new space uh, on uh, 3rd Street in Harrisburg, right across from the Broad Street Market. Welcome, Julie. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the Radish and Rye Food Hub? Yeah, we are an all-local green grocer in Midtown. Um, so everything we carry is locally grown or produced. We have a variety of produce, of grass-fed local meat and dairy, and then also pantry items like locally grown organic flour, pickles, vinegars, hot sauces, granola. Um, and then just recently, we also have kind of a small but growing selection of more convenience foods that we're making in our kitchen here. Um, and those are all made from the same ingredients that we sell. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, folks may may know you uh, from, uh, certainly from uh, your time at the Broad Street Market, but now you've moved into your own space. What what spurred the, uh, the move to um, uh, create this uh, beautiful, and I do mean beautiful, it's, a, it's been a tremendous transformation of, uh, of uh, into a, a, just an incredible space. And I know you've worked hard at it all through the pandemic, but what, what spurred the move uh, to create your own um, venue? Yeah, um, we actually started on the project well before the pandemic. Our plan was to have the market stand, which of course was only three days a week, but also to have this standalone location that we could have open uh, originally the plan was seven days a week, but but to be more accessible and available on those non market days um, and also to have a, a bigger footprint because our market space was so small. Um, but when the when the pandemic hit, we found that um, it, it just didn't feel safe in our tiny little space, especially given the time constraints, you know, it was it was always a, a very dense space and uh, demand increased a lot as restaurants closed and people, you know, all grocery stores were experiencing a lot of, a lot of demand. Um, and it, it just wasn't really working in that tiny space in three days a week. Um, so we, we originally were just trying to, you know, have, have a second location. Um, but then the, the market just didn't feel viable without that density. Yeah. Now, now you've touched on this, but you, you're in an industry in the grocery industry, which which is actually one of the few in industries which which saw 
growth and probably phenomenal growth really in the midst of the pandemic. And I, uh, I know from uh, my own experience that uh, you, you adapted uh, very early on providing uh, curbside uh, pickup and online ordering. And uh, I mean, you, you were very well positioned. Tell us, um, tell us though about how you've, how you've been able to cope and deal with the demand, especially the demand for local uh, healthy, healthy food, which um, which is has become even even more important amidst uh, amidst the health crisis. Yeah, um, I am lucky enough to have a, a little bit of a tech background, and so when it became clear that we needed to to do something to try to reduce physical in person density, um, I I didn't sleep for a week and built us a, a e commerce site. Um, that was never great, but it worked well enough to get us through those first few months. Um, and, and so we, we just transitioned to entirely curbside pickup with online ordering. Um, and that was a whole new business for us. It was really like uh, doing our existing jobs at a level we'd never experienced before because demand had increased so much and learning all new jobs. Um, so it, it was a huge challenge. We have an amazing staff um, and and everybody just worked really hard and was flexible and got us through it. Right, and do you still offer uh, a hybrid uh, model where we can still do uh, curbside as well as come in to see the, the new space? And can you tell us the hours of your new space? Yeah, so we are still offering curbside and we now have a, a much better website than the one I originally built for us. And we expect to continue the curbside thing forever. And our in-person shopping is open Tuesday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. And on Sundays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then we're, we're closed on Mondays. Great. And, and can you talk a little bit about how the pandemic has, uh, has affected um, the, the grocery business or the, um, the healthy foods industry uh, generally? I think our viewers would be interested. Yeah, so a lot of grocery stores experienced supply disruptions, uh, particularly early on in the pandemic. Um, supply chains, meat processing plants were all disrupted. Um, we were very, very lucky because our existing supply chain was already locally based that we experienced very little of that disruption. So we sometimes ran out of things just because I, I couldn't anticipate how huge the demand was. Um, and so hadn't placed big enough orders, but we, we experienced very few disruptions in what was getting to us, um, which I know is, is different for us than it was for a lot of grocers. Sure, and it uh, really speaks to the benefits of uh, uh, a locally uh, sourced uh, supply chain, one that uh, is maybe uh, immune to larger national uh, disruptions. Um, well, I just uh, it, it's I think it's important uh, to say that uh, our business community, which in general has been hard hit uh, by um, by the pandemic, um, is persevering, is innovating, um, and is going to bounce back stronger than than ever. We're, we're we're already seeing on an entrepreneurial side and on a business licensing side, uh, people uh, thinking that really now is the is the opportunity to um, you know to come back stronger. And I wanted to to tell your story because. It's it's such a such a wonderful story, and I want to encourage people to come by and see uh, see your see your new space. Is is there anything else you want to um, tell folks uh, today? I, I really want to express a lot of gratitude for our customers and neighbors who have been incredibly supportive over the past year. We were closed for much longer than we anticipated, uh, but people really stuck with us and kept us going. Um, our favorite part of being in the market was the wonderful sense of community there. And we, uh, even though we're not in the market anymore, we are really happy to feel like we've kept that community. Um, we love Harrisburg. That's great, thanks. And you're just across the street, so uh, uh, it's uh, it's all it's all still um, it's all still very close and very local. Thanks for thanks for all that you guys are doing. Give my best to Dusty, and we are going to go uh, now to Melissa Nicholson, who is the executive director at Gamut Theater. And Melissa, I wanted to check in with you all as well. Um, I know I know that there's been a lot of innovation at Gamut during the pandemic. Uh, you know uh, what can what can you tell our viewers about what you've been up to? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for having us on the show today. We really appreciate it. Um, so we 
we've done a lot of different innovative programs here during the pandemic. Um, as you may know, we have a huge education program at Gamut Theater. So one of the first things we wanted to do was we were really concerned with our education partners, all the schools that had to start teaching online, um, and we wanted to do something to help them. So we converted one of our classrooms into a recording studio. And uh, through that, we were able to make uh, an education program called Julius Caesar Goes Digital. Mm -hmm. We took photos from um, a past production that we had done, and we created five uh, digital episodes that are about 15 minutes each uh, that kind of tell the whole story of Julius Caesar. And we had a whole um, education packet that went with it. And from that, we went into an, a program for the public called Caesar in Rome, uh, where we worked with uh, a tour guide that we had met in Italy when Clark and I had the good fortune to visit Rome a few years ago. And we kept in touch with the tour guide. And uh, so together with Vincenzo, we created this dramatic travelogue of a combination of Caesar and travel. And we were able to put that out to the to the general public. All of our virtual programs that we've done at Gamut, we've tried to keep a focus on being able to have conversations with people because that's what everybody missed, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're not television and film actors, but we we know how to have a conversation. So everything that we tried to do was to, to spark conversations and then be able to do those online. Um, the second big education program that we did, we partnered with Sankofa African American Theater Company uh, to present a uh, celebration of local black history um, with a program called Do You Know Me, uh, which focuses on some important change agents uh, from the old Eighth Ward and other uh, uh, people from our history here in central Pennsylvania. This, this program was sponsored by uh, Dolphin County and Highmark. Uh, and then we were able to provide that to all the Dolphin County schools uh, for free. And we've had um, four talkbacks today. Actually, after this program, we'll be having our fourth uh, student talkback uh, today, this afternoon, to answer questions from that program. Oh, um, that's good. That yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that's great. I know uh, the talkbacks uh, so important, interactive uh, uh, engagement. I'm glad it's uh, it's you're still vibrantly uh, working with um, with with all the surrounding schools. Um, when I, when I think of Gamut, I, I think of uh, of your 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 family of uh, performing actors, uh, otherwise known as the performing cohort. Um, you know, what can you tell us about um, how how the actors and themselves have have been able to persevere through the pandemic? Well, we were uniquely positioned at the beginning of pandemic because our actors live in company housing. So when we went into uh, lockdown, they were their own bubble. They were already living together. So uh, that made it easy for them to perform together. Uh, so a, a, a performing cohort at Gamut are actors who are in their own bubble. So we have our core company actors. But then we also got creative. We, um, we produced a show that uh, featured a married couple. We have another show that's going to be coming up that has a, a, a husband, wife, and daughter uh, that are the performing cohort. So uh, what that means is they're able to perform together on stage unmasked because they are already in their own bubble. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of one of the innovative thoughts that we had going into our programming. Yeah, I, so I think a, a question on a lot of people's minds are, you know, uh, when are we going to be able to return to in-person programming, um, you know, and see live live theater again? I, I know that um, uh, there, there there was an attempt to return to that in the fall, um, and you look at the graph that we started the show with, and you'll you'll see that uh, it was right at the moment that it, uh, it 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 spiked higher than it's ever been before. Um, so you had to pull that back a bit. But what what is the um, you know? I keep saying there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, in the, in the world of theater, uh, where do you see us going, and uh, what types of safety precautions are are being put in place? 
Sure. So uh, Gamut developed a risk assessment early on so we could make our own decisions about when we thought it would be safe to have uh, people in the space, of course, socially distanced, masks that cover your nose and mouth, all the good things in place. Um, so we use the uh, Harvard's Brown School of Public Health um, to uh, measure key metrics, um, and we use the positivity rate. So those two things together are how we determine if we can have in-person shows. So we were able to do a show in September, a show in October that we shut down in November, because as everybody knows, that uh, numbers went crazy. But watching the trends of what's going on now, we are very hopeful that we are gonna open on April 9th with all of our health and safety protocols in place, very limited seating. Um, we are lucky at Gamut because we have a nice big space so we can space everyone out. Um, we're going to do uh, two short one act plays by August Strindberg in um, April called Two by Strindberg. And then in May, we're gonna do a family friendly the Adventures of Little Red Riding Hood. And in June, we are back out dun, to dun, the park. <laughs> Yay. Yay. And and what what's it going to be this year? Free Shakespeare in the Park. We are doing Hamlet. Oh. Back to back to back to basics. We're getting uh, that's going to be that's going to be incredible. We 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 need it. Uh, I think that'll be a real a real moment uh, for Harrisburg. And to top it off, I now understand that you are a certified COVID nineteen compliance officer. Uh, congratulations! You can uh, <laughs> you can take that that training with you as as we move forward. But no, in in all seriousness, we uh, we're we're. Um, uh, people are, are craving and really starving for uh, for live theater to, to return, and it's good to know. Uh, two by Strindberg in, uh, in coming in April, Ventures of Little Red Riding Hood, and then uh, culminating here this summer with uh, a, a wonderful outdoor um, opportunity. Shakespeare in the Park will be back. Uh, what year will this be for Shakespeare in the Park? This will be the 28th. Wow. 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 No, okay. Crazy. okay. Well, uh, Melissa, is there anything else uh, you'd like to let viewers know? Yes, I do have one other exciting announcement. Right. Um, in January of 2022, Gamut Theater is going to be hosting the International Shakespeare Theater Association Conference. Um, so we are already in the throes of planning that. We are partnering with the Hilton here downtown, the Whitaker Center, uh, Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra, Market Square Concerts. So in addition to hosting the conference and having um, representatives from Shakespeare theaters all over the world coming to Harrisburg, we're gonna have a whole community component um, running at the same time. So there's gonna be performances and special events that the community will be able to take part in too to celebrate Shakespeare. Oh, that's oh, something that. really to look forward to. That'll be that'll be great. Can't wait. All right. We'll talk about how the city can uh, can help partner with you and get the word out. And um, uh, I can't uh, can't wait for, for for that to happen. So thanks. Thanks, uh, Melissa, for joining us. Thanks to all our guests. Just a quick programming note. We were going to have uh, Bradley Wainwright. He is uh, the CEO and the owner of Urban Revolution Marketing and Branding. They're the uh, company that just produced the very successful Black is Beautiful uh, Expo uh, downtown at the Crown Plaza that uh, I had the pleasure of um, uh, visiting with. Bradley had um, had a uh, had a, a personal emergency this morning, couldn't join us. So we will have him back in the future. Um, and moment, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I imagine we've we've had some questions from our audience, and uh, yeah, you can take it away. Yeah, it's been a great conversation. I want to thank our guests. I just wanted to take a moment, um, an opportunity to, um, uh, for anyone that does have questions uh, that come in later, they can contact uh, all of our guests uh, via their websites. So I'll just uh, list those. WhitakerCenter.org uh, for the Whitaker Center. Radish and Rye is at RadishandRyeHBG.com. Gamut Theater is uh, GamutTheater.org. And for those that have questions about the um, incredible the STEM project, uh, they can reach the teacher Allison Sturbinsky at a s t e r sorry a s t e r b i n s k y at cdschools.org, and for more information about the program, they can search for Samsung Samsung Solve for Tomorrow. Okay. So, yep. Great. 
Great, Moomin. Okay, well, we'll we will leave it at that because uh, we've uh, we've exhausted the full hour. So, um, uh, again, thank you to the, all the guests for uh, for being here. Thanks for the uh, perseverance and the innovation that you're doing. Um, uh, I'm encouraged, and uh, it's it's always uh, it's always good to to see all the the amazing things that are happening in Harrisburg and the region. So, thanks for having uh, been with us this morning, uh, and we will see you next week on uh, our our Friday at noon uh, community conference. Conversation. If it's Fridays at noon, you're going to be right here with me. Uh, until then, I'm Mayor Eric Papenfuss saying thank you for watching, stay safe, and be well.